Hello everyone. Today we talk about Achaemenid armored cavalry. Uh, it's an interesting topic um, that allows, by the way, to expand also broadly into others, uh, relatively to the cavalries and not only, but generally the armies and fighters of the ancient world. And um, this specific point. So um, uh, I think. It's a question that recurs a little bit, uh, given the general confusion that exists sometimes uh, when you look at social media, etc. What, what is it? Did really the Achaemenid army have armored cavalry? And this is a kind of recurrent question, also in other ages, relatively to Persian warfare or to others that were actually influenced by Persian warfare. Um, uh, when it comes to, I don't know, did the, the Muslim armies, for instance, of the um, of the uh, times of uh, following the Iranian conquest, things like cataphracts, you know, like the the Sassanids had had uh, before the, the conquest. Um, how was this cavalry, and what was the relation, let's say, with the the ancient um, armored cavalry traditions that existed, in fact, in that area, and uh, how were they originated? Now, I've already made. A uh, couple of videos. Uh, if you're going, I, I created a, uh, a Persian warfare playlist. Interestingly enough, I I, I realized I had made um, several videos about uh, Persian warfare in several times in history. So I decided to to make a uh, playlist about that, and uh, much is dedicated even in, into that playlist to armored cavalry. Here it is. Just clicking on it. Um, with the time of the Sassanids, uh, actually 6th, 7th century, and the Ilkhanid heavy cavalrymen of the 13th, 14th century. And the point is, when is that, you know, at that point, obviously, uh, Persian cavalry, we're talking about the Middle Ages, of course, um, was already famous for its cataphract tradition. Cataphract, let, let's remember it, for it, it's a, a very generic term that kind of creates a bit of confusion sometimes, um, even in itself, for instance, what's the difference between the, the cataphracts and the clibanari, for instance? And that's all things that we will have to explain. But um, it creates problems because um, we often forget that ancient and also medieval uh, terms are rather generic. They don't have that character of scientific um, uh, categor categorization that our language, our words have come to assume, especially after the Enlightenment, etc. The term cataphract uh, cataphract in itself is pretty, is pretty generic. It comes from Greek and it simply means armored, right? So, technically speaking, talking about cataphract uh, cavalry um, is something you can apply to to every kind of armored cavalry, that uh, uh, type of cavalry that either in the cavalryman or the horse is uh, armed with, uh, is is uh, equipped with with some part of armor, even a little. Uh, part. Of course, um, the term has come historiographically mostly to identify instead the, the fully armored cavalry, um, you know, the one that in fact you see with chiefly with the Clibanari, etc. And that um, is often, uh, is very often identified with, with in fact, Persian cavalry, in that case the Sassanids, but also the Parthians, previously under the Arsacid dynasty that ruled over uh, Iran and in other areas of the Middle East. And, and saying, you know, that's, yeah, that, that's Persian, like, so it's as if something is stamped from the Iranian plateau, etc. But what we often for, forget in a broader perspective, and in studying the Achaemenids, this is very, very important, is that, that actually the same um, dynasties that came to rule over the Iranian plateau were fundamentally not autochthonous. I mean, the Iranian plateau has always had, obviously, from since the time of the Indo-European migrations, this uh, kind of uh, element that came from, yeah, that is pretty homogeneous to what, what you find, I mean, relatively homogeneous to what you find also in, in the north. So that, that that's why Farsi is an Indo-European language. Uh, that's why general Persian culture and identity is uh, Indo-European. But uh, in this moment in history, um, be, and... Uh, Say before the um, not in this specific moment of um, of the the, the Achaemenid that, that we will be discussing now between the effectively the the, the fourth um, the, the fifth and fourth century, but before you know it, there had been a before right um, where the 
Persians had arrived as Indo-Aryans and settled in, in the Iranian plateau. And these troops, these peoples, were uh, bringing, they were mostly a military, tribal, warlike peoples, were bringing with them this um, renown um, and very ancient uh, horse riding tradition that is typical of the steppes that included the cataphract. Now, we won't, naturally, we don't have time in this video to make a history of why, you know, when and how this was formed. Uh, just let's suffice to, to understand that when we talk about the Achaemenids, about the, the, the Medians as such as they came to, to rule over and, and eventually crashed the Assyrian Empire and, and created this large Achaemenid Empire, we're talking about Scythians, as a matter of fact. We're talking about peoples that came from the nomadic steppes and that brought with them this uh, heavily armored tradition. Now, uh, that was typical of those peoples that actually had a very tiny elite there was armored, uh, but it still was on horseback, uh, as, as uh, you know, basically all the troops that dwelled in, in the steppes uh, at this point, uh, with, a, with a large mass of lighter cavalry. And naturally, you can see in this the, the political and social segmentations, and not just of the, um, of, the in, uh, of the society itself, but also the various tribes that, you know, the, generally the ruling one was the wealthier, the most powerful that had subjugated the others, and therefore they had more resource more more wealth to to equip themselves with this heavy armor that w by the way was used especially at this point in history chiefly um, because of uh, uh, it was a consequence of arrow fire right the, the steps it was full of horse archers and when we look at this very heavily armored cavalrymen we don't have to imagine them as much as the shock um, charging cavalry, uh, like say, let's say in medieval fashion, it was definitely capable of doing that. Actually, the cavalry uh, of the steps were pretty, pre but they were still relatively um, more primitive. And and this very heavy degree of armored uh, equipment definitely had to do chiefly with all the f the arrows that were shot around, etc. And uh, what happened in the Achaemenid Empire is that, at this p given these premises, you should say, well, but then uh, it doesn't seem the uh, the Achaemenid um, army had anything like cataphracts. And it is actually correct. We, we don't have evidence of that. Um, we don't have any direct evidence, at least. I believe um, this existed in some sort, probably, especially in the origins, the, the original moment where these populations of Iranic stock uh, occupied this Middle Eastern uh, regions, um, and um, this is something that, that they partially probably maintained in some form, also in the kind of feudal or, or quasi-feudal um, uh, social organization that, 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 that Persia had. Uh, but in fact, in, the in, the, in evidence, we don't we don't find things like cataphracts. Cataphracts in the ancient world remain fundamentally confined to uh, to the steppes and later uh, appear in this Iranian uh, area chiefly uh, with the Parthians uh, and uh, they, they're also partly imitated um, as this fully armored cavalry that eventually became famous chiefly um, also because the Romans fought against them later but and, 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 and it was announced with uh, chiefly under the, the Sassanid under the Sassanid period, but now that's uh, you know, I don't want to 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 confuse you <laughs> more than much if you if you're not already acquainted with these topics, because um, answering to the question, um, the the Achaemenids lost had lost this. I mean, in, in their military organization over the centuries, we see that um, this um, heavy are uh, heavily armored uh, elite. And that probably had existed in a more uh, or less distant past, as you can see among the Scythians proper, where, where the, let's stress this, where the Achaemenids, the Medians actually stemmed from, um, is is is, is um, abandoned in some part. The reasons of this are uh, are many. Actually, um, the, the military, the, there is a, a, a logical reason, as as always, and also pretty pragmatic and rational one. Um, I believe that in the steppes, uh, given the the social order, that w political order that we described before, uh, it's kind of um, uh, normal to say, okay, that there is an, an 
ultra elite, right? That can wear this more uh, this this heavier equipment. You can see that um, also with the. I made a video on Scythian cavalry, if, I, if I'm not wrong, that discusses that. But the, the wide majority of troops will not have. What what happens when these people sedentarize is that, first of all, there is one big change: is is sedentarization in itself, which means that uh, you don't you stop being a nomad and you start having a social organization that. Uh, is basically a more advantageous because you came to those sedentary lands effectively to exploit the wealth that you don't have in the steppes and that you always try to raid and then it happens that these raiders effectively become uh, the, the settlers eventually and start fighting in fact against the, uh, the nomads in part and this happened in fact both to Achaemenids, to the Parthians, to the Sassanids, um, etc. in spite being of coming from, from there themselves um, originally. So a, a big deal of this transformation naturally has to do with the available, large availability of infantry and we know that definitely Achaemenid armies were mostly about infantry which doesn't have absolutely to make us think that cavalry was not important anymore actually uh, Achaemenid cavalry was very important very well, um, very well used, very well organized the Greeks found that how, uh, out the, the hard way uh, when they fought against them, and they um, and and they definitely knew how to horse ride to fight on horseback, and especially in the in, in still in the elites, right? The the majority, you know, the idea was that uh, it was the Aryan idea that every kind of freeman was a warrior and had to be noble. There was this um, very strong elitistic and uh, and but at the same time warlike and ethos into into the Iranian culture uh, that uh, that was pretty much alive in the Achaemenid world and that naturally is still so in, in the night proper on the mounted uh, warrior a uh, the, the model of of, um, of of nobility proper actually and we know in fact from several sources uh, chiefly also thanks to the Hellenic historiography that uh, the Persians were were excellent. The Persian nobility, especially, was uh, were excellent cavalry. They were trained with basically every weapon that existed around. And even in here, we, even if we don't have the evidence, for instance, of uh, horse archers that might have been, you know, might have remained, because definitely all kind of uh, all of these societies um, maintained, uh, especially in aristocracy, this idea that you had to hunt, for instance on horseback and using arrow, uh, bow and arrow, we perfectly know about that, but it's a bit like in in, in the feudal world in, in the, the western middle ages when you find that um, basically there's not a big deal of horse archery, uh, like think about the Normans etc that mostly fought with lance and, and sword and javelin still at their point, that you don't find horse archers, but you actually know that all these troops knew perfectly how to use uh, uh, the bow, both on horseback and on foot, and they simply didn't do it because they had, and there are also some cultural reasons, probably also some uh, propagandistic reasons that uh, hit a little bit of this dimension, and when we talk about Achaemenid times, definitely we don't know that huge much. We're lucky enough to have a lot of evidence, but when it comes to detail we can't really be sure we have to approximate uh, a lot. But when it comes to armor, um, the, the, the general idea is that armor is something extremely expensive. You have always to start from, from this. Cavalry in itself is already enormously expensive just from in terms of maintaining the, the animals and um, feeding them and, and um, uh, making them drink. I mean, it, it's, it's an enormous logistical... Um, uh, they require a lot in terms of resources. So uh, cavalry is definitely contained in numbers, especially in, and obviously in sedentary civilizations that prefer to rely chiefly on, on infantry because infantry, in spite of all, at this point is still kind of a superior arm. You rarely find this history of the world infantry that are effectively broken by cavalry, especially in the sanitary world. Um, and um, even at the outskirts of, of the steppes were definitely um, the, the, the encounter between mostly cavalry-based and infantry-based armies 
did did actually occur. If you look in in, in that video I made on Scythian warfare, you you can find uh, an example of examples of that. Um, so the concept is infantry is cheaper. Uh, it's generally more effective because infantry as an arm has some. I, 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 on average, at least on average, which doesn't mean at all times in history, but most times in history, an intrinsic advantage over cavalry. This is never to be forgotten. But secondly, um, and therefore there is no no convenience to, to do that. And secondly, having armored cavalry is an extra force. It's just like having armored infantry. And we know that Achaemenid armies were uh, not particularly armored. I mean, they were not like the I don't know the the Hellenic phalanx, for instance, that was grounded in the idea that all the hoplites had to have a sort of heavy armor, etc. And they were tough to to break, etc. But um, this doesn't mean at all that uh, for this reason the Achaemenids were inferior tactically speaking. There is this uh, incredibly ridiculous um, prejudice. Um, for which we believe that at the time of the, the Persian Wars, uh, the the Greeks were kind of more advanced militarily speaking than the Achaemenids. It's ab absolutely false, and the the Greek victories uh, have n anything nothing to do with effectively with their uh, with, with this ratio of uh, of more you know who was more advanced. The, the Achaemenids were way more advanced. The Greeks won for for other reasons, for ability, skill, leadership luck as well but uh, lo logistics as well also in terms of you know the, the problems that the Achaemenids have so it's extremely complicated but never underestimate the Achaemenid army because it was literally the most advanced thing that existed at the time in terms of, of military effectiveness um, especially in Western Eurasia and um, having said this um, this ex effectively explains pretty clearly how and why the most of uh, of these cavalries were were not heavily armored, and and why especially these these dynasties that came from the from the Scythian world when they came to centralize and create these huge empires uh, on the base actually of these millenary civilizations that existed around Mesopotamia fundamentally um, uh, came to to lose their 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 military traditions. Um, in the general organization of the wall army, the aristocracy maintains the ethos that is pretty strong, pretty strongly Indo-European, and therefore deeply grounded in the idea of the cavalryman as the 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 perfect uh, freeman, fundamentally. Um, but uh, it's obvious that there were other and more effective means and, and cheaper means to to obtain more. And in the Achaemenid army, this mostly stemmed from combined uh, arm tactics. That is, in fact, uh, something the the Greeks at this point didn't didn't quite have. Uh, and and the Persian armies were ex extremely effective in maneuvering, in, in 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 making cavalry and infantry interact. They had a level of training the, the Greek hoplites, maybe with the exception, the usual exception of the Spartans, that in fact confirmed the rule. However, um, didn't didn't do. Um, and all with cheaper units, that is, to lighter units that are uh, more apt to, to move to, and uh, and to to therefore interact with, with one with each other and uh, carrying out combined tactics uh, effectively. Um, there, there will be a lot to say about this. I promise that I will speak um, thoroughly in detail about uh, Persian uh, Achaemenid tactics in this case. And how their armies worked, were organized, etc. But uh, this explains in part. It is important to explain in part why, in fact, heavy cavalry was so few in number, and why cataphracts did did not basically did not exist, and and why also uh, this was a time, by the way, into which the the cataphracts, even in the steppes, were kind of in, uh, yet to be fully developed in the in the way at least we we see in later times in during. Uh, especially uh, Hellenistic times, uh, etc. Um, but um, armored cavalry, um, and this is important also to not to create uh, misunderstandings, naturally belonged to other populations, right? So, um, how did it start, however, in the Achaemenid army and what we know about this? So, um, the in, in the Achaemenid army, given this. Um, 
uh, let's say, separating now and from, from their previous paths of the steps, we, we see that even during the same Achaemenid Empire, there was a progressive wagoning of, uh, of armor in general, both in cavalry and in infantry. Um, this occurred also um, in similar ways it would happen um, in, in Sassanid times, for instance. I mean, there is the idea that feudalism in itself, albeit not being, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, with, the, with the increased uh, sedentarization of these populations, feudalism brings uh, more resources into the hands of the aristocracy that therefore is uh, capable of keeping itself in a heavier fashion. So that even if you don't have cataphracts that are this literally the same thing that, that exists in the steppes, you have still, especially in terms of degree of uh, armoredness, let's say, um, something pretty similar. Right, and um, we will have to talk about these differences. Uh, if you go, I've, I think I made uh, once again. If you go into Persian um, warfare playlist, I think I made something about um, the Sassanid Persian army introduction. This is titled the video that I address these differences, these slight differences that that exist. Um, so, if you're interested in, in them, you know where to find to search, um, and uh, so. The, with the strengthening, let's say, of the the, Senate, the consolidation of the empire, its structures, it, its its administration, it was kind of easier progressively from the steps uh, average to have, on average, in fact, even more heavily armored uh, troopers. Uh, this is I important to understand that generally speaking, the steps produce, as we have seen, a, 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 a tiny yet ultra armored elite. Um, but if you look at sedentary populations, they're generally wealthier. So uh, overall, they will be kind of more heavily equipped than the average of the steps that is that is and remains. However, always the horse archers that the horse archer that has very often not even a single piece of armor, not even a helmet, and just relies on, on speed for this very reason and attacking at a distance. So what happens in the Achaemenian Empire is there is a progressive heavening of the armor. And this comes to uh, include at a certain point a partial armor for their horses. Mm -hmm. So previous to the, Ach the Achaemenids, the, the 7th century uh, Assyrian cavalry had had some form of armor. Some of them, uh, some of it some s seems to have been even made of textile. Um, there's nothing to be surprised of. It's like the, the gambeson in, in the more famous, let's say at least, gambeson in medieval times. Basically every, um, every, um, every army in history before eventually the, the, the spread of firearms, etc., had some form of um, or organic material armor that was better than, than nothing, let's say. Um, actually, things like Gambeson can do miracles, uh, given especially the, the average blow that you tend to receive in a battle that is usually not straight, this usually doesn't arrive at full strength, etc. So this was perfectly normal. Um, a great problem that we have with um, uh, e especially iconographic evidence of, uh, well, of course, in archaeology, uh, organic material usually doesn't survive, um, but also with iconography, we we often don't know what where wh what is represented is meant to be textile, leather, uh, metal. Um, so these are conjectures. Probably there, there was uh, a lot more um, of organic armor uh, out there than than we usually uh, we usually are prone to think. Needless to say, obviously, the, the metal one, in spite of its cost, was definitely the most effective. And that's why the elite has always uh, tried to to, uh, to have it, to provide it for, for itself. So uh, this was normal. Um, and, um, and it seems that in Assyrian warfare, um, you know, the Achaemenids effectively win, crush the, the Assyrians, and they take their place. So that's wh how they... Why we are talking about the Assyrians now? So this had seemingly um, s even some um, some evidence of um, even chariot horses protected with some sort of bronze scale or something like that. Um, that is important, also considering the importance of um, 
of chariot warfare into uh, the Assyrian armies. Um, it's kind of understandable also because, as remember, Assyrian Sy uh, army was dominated in many ways by by um, bow uh, lo uh, the by bowmen. Uh, so the idea of having you know chariots, tra you know, the horse in itself is already a pretty large and easy target usually for for missile troops. Um, there was plenty of, of chariots, etc. Ch chariots are very delicate. If you even wound or uh, kill, or, or even just wound or cripple one horse, you can uh, knock it out in some way. Uh, so there is nothing strange if the Assyrians ever tried to, to use at this point heavy uh, armor for their own horses. However, there there really doesn't seem to be, uh, which is not a proof of 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 inexistence in absolute terms, but it's still. Uh, historically, we can't say uh, much more. Is that there is no apparently direct link between this uh, Syrian defenses and the 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 eventual emergence of a Persian horse armor in what appears to be actually the, the late fifth century. Uh, um, and this is important. So you re realize that that there are also several, I mean, a couple of centuries. Of of difference uh, of absence of evidence at least um, from our side, um, which is not evidence of absence. Um, so um, Herodotus says something uh, particularly meaningful as he explains that um, the the Iran Eastern Iranic tribe of the Massagetai or Massagetai, if you prefer, um, uh, had some cavalry um, uh, at their defeat um, uh, of Cyrus the Great in the late 6th century. And that this cavalry had some bronze breast armor. Mm -hmm. So it seems uh, breast armor for, for horses is kind of uh, the most frequent type of armor you find in, 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 in the ancient world in general. There is this uh, this band in front of the horse chest, so it's really the, the biggest uh, part that, um, together with the head, in fact, is usually uh, is, is the most exposed. And in fact, you, most of our uh, of horse armor at this point everywhere is is the the one on, on the fr on, on the forehead and on on the chest. Um, the and the same Herodotus, so uh, th definitely the, the Persians at that point knew this, at least this kind of, of armor, having fought against the, the Massagetae, that by the way were this, uh, we said it, Eastern Iranic tribe that dwelled uh, somewhere in, into far of the, the, the Ox, uh, north of the northeast, yes, of the Oxa River. Um, and they, uh, they were kind of similar to the early. Uh, I mean, to to the Medians fundamentally. So th they they all came from this large Iranic branch of the Indo-European peoples. So there were, and and, and in there, I can assure you, it, it's extremely uh, everything was extremely homogeneous. I mean, at the source, in the steppe, mm -hmm. so that uh, there is a striking similarity even between the, in, in the armor and warfare of peoples of different ethnicity. For instance, with the Turks. And the uh, Indo-Europeans, but you can't really tell even who's who. And in there, and this is because the the step uh, steps environment definitely molds uh, in its uh, nature, in its character, all these peoples in kind of the same way. But the same Herodotus says, uh, and this is particularly important, in fact, and goes in perfect accordance with what we have just said, is that the a later a commanded uh, heavily let's say heavily armored cavalry was inspired by the Saka model. This Saka would be the Scythians fundamentally. So these peoples um, Saka is a um, I think the, the same Persians called them like this, but it would be the, the Scythians of uh, even in, in among the, the, the Greeks. Uh, actually no well the, the Greeks called them the Scutai but it's uh, there were basically this large amount of peoples in there in the steppes that, that chiefly of Iranic origin at this point. Um, so this statement is particularly important because uh, it definitely uh, show, uh, shows us the link that existed between the 
late Achaemenid cavalry ar ar uh, armor and those the Saka of the steppe. So this great amount of peoples from which the same Achaemenids and the Medians had come from originally speaking. And there is nothing to be surp uh, to be surprised of because the um, the, the Persian Empire definitely bordered with th these peoples, these populations constantly, especially in the Iranian plateau there was always a historically for, for millennia this, ex this exchange between you know lots of various uh, the s um, nomadic tribes were settling there that's the same in a nutshell how, how also the, the Parthians came to, in, to Persia how other um, peoples etc so and how in origin also the the, the Achaemenids had done so the the idea was okay uh, these peoples knew perfectly where they came from by the way they knew what their people these peoples were uh, and how they fought and they hired them and we'll see that even in battles against Alexander the Great, etc., there was plenty of of this uh, eastern stand, uh, these steps, let's say, better auxiliaries into the Persian armies, and these were troops that you could find basically old at all times. Like even in the Assyrian period, the Scythians acro went across the the wall, the wall near in the Middle East with the expeditions, etc. So. These were areas that definitely knew each other. I mean, between the Middle East, Near East, and the steppes, that knew each other perfectly, and that had, in this sense, also a lot of intersections, like Herodotus uh, now has uh, has told us. So definitely, the Saka model is the one of the armored cavalry, uh, at least in the elite, and that's where the Achaemenids think to I mean, to revive, seemingly at least for what Herodotus uh, explained it like. Their their late heavy um, heavy armor for for horsemen. So when did this actually begin, or better, when do we have the first historical evidence of such armor? Um, there is a uh, th there is usually the equipment referred to the Babylonian colonist Gadal Yama in 422 B.C. That is usually recorded. Uh, as been at least in, in, in or at least it was in the past recorded as this very first uh, evidence of uh, um, uh, iron caparison for the horse and leather armor for the rider. But um, this was the um, the, the there is a, a mistranslation fundamentally of, of the term. This should sound something like sa or something like that. That um, in fact it's it's not to be meant as the Horse armor proper, but for the 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 rider's uh, armor. Yeah. So the the idea is that yeah, this guy from Babylonia was fundamentally equipped with had at least to, to provide himself a uh, an armor uh, a metal armor uh, uh, iron armor actually equipment, and that's uh, that's pretty much it. And there is nothing. New uh, in in this as uh, armored horsemen had always kind of existed also in the area. I mean always, of course, from from several times. Um, and the the and and, and it, it is in many ways traditional also to the uh, uh, Achaemenid cavalry. I mean, definitely Achaemenid cavalry always maintain a certain degree of armoredness. That was not the full cataphrag thing, but definitely had parts of, of armor. And and this is actually something so normal to to explain because, you know, armor existed, the Persian obviously used it. There is large evidence of this. And th there could be either cavalrymen or infantrymen who used it. So what where's the problem? This is nothing to be impressed by. And uh by the way, Gadal's Yama equip Gadal Yama's equipment also included uh by the way spear and bow together with iron body armor, but an unarmored horse. So if we are to uh, look further into this, the first recorded use of horse armor is instead uh, the one in uh, Xenophon's uh, Anabasis that um, describes fundamentally the, the guards of Sirius the Younger. Um, and these are 600 uh, horsemen that were armed with cuirasses and thigh pieces. Um, 
the uh, the term in Greek for thigh pieces is parameridia. That we will see is uh, is also that there is the parapleuridia, which is a little bit different. The basically the parameridia is the thigh piece, while the parapleuridia is the side pieces for defending the the, the flanks, the side. And um, so these were, according to Xenophon. Um, uh, all these these guardsmen were kept with helmets, mm? uh, helmets except for S Cyrus himself. Probably, by the way, b b who, uh, was meant to to uh, was described as going to battle into battle bareheaded. Mm? This is particularly important because probably it had to do. I'm just guessing, and I really don't know, but it had to do with the ancient ideals also in here of the steps of the ancient, our age. Uh, cavalry uh, warrior, uh, because in in the, the culture of the steps, there is definitely the idea that okay, yeah, the 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 more powerful and the stronger, the more noble you are, um, and and uh, and the better it is, of course. But I as as a material consequence, the the better equipped you are and the more armored you are. But still, there is the idea that the the single horse archer. Is the kind of grade zero that you don't have to be ashamed to be it, and that you actually are supposed to be if you want to, uh, even to to rise uh, into the ranks, let's say. So um, uh, it this kind of uh, also humble and and therefore not pretentious state of um, <laughs> of, of um, level of cavalry, let's say, um, is definitely still something that uh, also proves to be more courageous as this the, the horseman is uh, meant if it's not a keep if it's not armored actually um, is meant to be also more courageous because it can be wounded it it has to rely on speed and in in a short to be a, a very good cavalryman which also the the heavy one has to be but let's say that there there are way more things um, in in terms of horse riding that the 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 lighter horseman can do that the the heavier one is hampered by because of his equipment his equipment. So um, probably this is the idea that you know going to battle bareheaded, which is something, by the way, very risky because probably every single kind of uh, uh, of warrior in history, if he had to protect something, was first of all, first and foremost his head. Mm -hmm. And uh, and probably in fact th th this special also organic material coifs or uh, or quaffs, sorry, um, or other headgear was. Probably way more spread than than we usually we usually think, uh, and but uh, still, what is important here is that uh, the parameridia, so the thigh pieces that were, um, as as we will see now, um, uh, the um, they were attached in several w in 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 some ways. We we also it's also partly conjectural to protect the thigh, um, and. Interestingly enough, the same Xenophon, um, uh, uh, in 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 fact, the Anabasis 1.8 says in the same passage that all the horses of the guards had armor f uh, for their forehead and breast. Mm? So this is particularly interesting because it's basically that level of armor that we we were talking about before that was in many ways in the sedentary world basically the heaviest kind of um of horse armor you you could find mm -hmm. um, uh then he also adds that the um the the uh, this cav uh, these guardsmen were also um equipped with the um with Greek curved swords, actually. So, this is particularly interesting because the same Xenophon, uh, so you know, explains how curved swords are better on horseback, etc. But these were of Greek type. So, uh, actually, the th this uh, kind of uh, of swords that would be fundamentally the corpus as they are uh, conceived. They, they were widespread at the time in every single place uh, around the, the Middle East, the Mediterranean, etc. So. It, Okay, the, uh, we don't really know what Xenophon is talking about, but we find it precisely. I mean, but 
this was not th that kind of swords were not just Greek. Actually, they stemmed all from from the same Greeks had gotten them uh, from from other areas. They 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 got they can go back really even to very ancient times of Egyptian swords, um, etc. That are that have this very um, uh, very easy uh, and um, you know very uh, compact and um, form that is uh, that that this is likely curved it's relatively short uh, but it's excellent it's like it would be some some English translations you find the saber but it's not really a saber as we we mean we mean it the saber is usually something much longer and thinner uh, in its blade uh, these were um, the uh, the copies proper that also was pretty similar to the Barian uh, Falcata that eventually inspired even the, the Roman Gladius in part. So, um, and they were uh, they they also stamped uh, uh, very from from other type of of swords that were way more ancient. And the uh, this is, however, particularly important because uh, uh, the fact that the the sword was um of greek uh fashion uh basically um it is is used by xenophon to say to 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 tell us look th these guys also used uh, armor that was used also by the greeks right or that was renowned at least to to be greek or to to similarly have been imported from Greece or adopted in a Greek fashion. This is important because it tells you how like all great empires and all great militaries of the world you know uh, you you use basically the best weapons around and you don't really care where, where they come from. Albeit, as we have explained this um, uh, sword shape uh, was actually something you know way more widespread and, and there was no need for the Persians to look at the Greeks to have it because they, they, they already exist in the essentials, um, the uh, the same source says, by the way, that these guardsmen were equipped with javelins, and uh, this is also a kind of uh, grade zero of of cavalry, in especially in the sanitary uh, in the sanitary world. Actually, also in the steps, there were lots of javeliners, not just horse archers, but definitely in the sanitary world. This time, it's very rare to find like a horse archer's archer proper. In fact, bows are not mentioned by Xenophon for these guards. So the same Xenophon in the Kudopaidea uh, 7 um, 1 describes also um, Sirius the Great's guards. Mm? And um, the um, and, um, and and these are in fact also very similar to Sir Cyrus the, the Younger's uh, guards that, that we have seen. There is just one addition that Xenophon makes that is basically that uh, all the armor was bronze um, and that the elements had a white crest. Mm? And here it also adds the parapleuridia, so what we were talking before. So it basically says that these guys, um, they, uh, they didn't have just, uh, or better, um, the, the horse... Um, the side pieces worked for uh, in uh, of the horse armor worked also as thigh pieces for the riders. So basically, these were larger uh, 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 pieces of armor that we don't have to actually think to be entire pieces of metal like plate armor. They were probably um, because the we don't find any evidence of that kind of armor anywhere, and especially it would have been very costly and very expensive. Usually. When we, you you find this this uh, metal armor, is um, especially with its um, like uh, not lamellar, also lamellar actually, but I, I always forget the the name scale actually, yeah, scale armor in English. I never remember that uh, scale armor that is basically all many little scales sewn in onto a um, a support that is usually uh, organic because also can be very flexible so that it's like leather or other stuff and that uh, and that is also more uh, more comfortable to 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 wear actually um, so 
this uh, witness of oxanophon is particularly important because it, it tells us that at least the uh, kings of kings guards were equipped with this kind of uh, were mounted and they were uh, armored both uh, that the the horsemen and and um, and actually this part of um, of of horse armor that uh, that served actually also as a thigh piece for the riders. Um, this is important because it it exists also in other contexts, especially of the steps where you find this horse armor that sometimes from the horse's chest and shoulders basically expands in the uh, outwards um, on the sides and therefore protects like a like a shield in the front of the horse. Also the horseman's thigh and it's a kind of a clever uh, mean to before obviously because the horse um, naturally has first of all this is usually heavy cavalry so that there's not much else that the horse should do rather than charging or going straight the, the usually you want you 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 don't use this cavalry to to do very complex and long and tiring maneuvers because the the the, the horses are bite selected in their race for you know being tougher as he for heavy cavalry etc they, they will get tired pretty easily um, uh, but they uh, they're very uh, so th that they obviously add extra weight but at the same time they don't take away much mobility from the horse that you may potentially use it protects you but it also protects the cavalryman but it doesn't make him uh, hampering its movements because the, the in this sense the armor is attached to the horse not to the horseman and, and the horseman can still move kind of more dynamically on horseback which is something instead that is expected to do in the melee or whatever weapon is is using because because actually um, even though there was a tactical differentiation historically between um, the, the, the the in fact the heavy cavalrymen the, the shock cavalry and the horse archers um, originally in the steps that there was a kind of a similarity to this I mean the elite uh, heavy cavalry was usually also capable and equipped with bows on the field and could do really both things but and this this actually um, is um, is uh, we're talking about the, the finest man on on in, in cavalry history probably given the, the degree of, uh, of training and capabilities that they had which means that basically it was a, a cavalry that could do combined tactics in in it without differentiating in the two kinds that is to exhaust the enemy with a horse with archer fire and then charging like with this heavy shock effect but it's uh, eventually the, the two models kind of separate because evidently it was not so f so efficient uh, and it's also difficult to tell whether you know this was ever prevalent probably never actually but it still existed in some form and and the Achaemenids were pretty close to that as well and in any case they knew how to use that we those weapons on on horseback we know that actually even Persian cavalry could be other kinds of cavalry could could be equipped with several several types of weapons in here we have the in fact we, we, the, the coppice the, the javelins etc um, and uh, is there I any evidence of this horse armor well yes th there is in the uh, on actually on a lost monument that is being um, however pictured in, in in some form and therefore preserve at least uh, from uh, Yeni it's a Koi I believe that is uh, so in today's Turkey actually in the near the um, Dasculion that was a uh, satrapal capital uh, in the uh, of the region um, of the Achaemenid Empire and also on another um, on a sarcophagus from Lycia uh, um, at pa uh, Payava, actually, and it, it's not so easy to understand how this uh, this armor was built from these two uh, sources because um, uh, it, we we can't see whether it, the, the armor is attached to the horse or to the saddle. Um, so technically speaking, we we don't really know how it was, but it looks either th th these two options basically. Um, the and uh, and and as we were saying before, um, uh, Albite Xenophon says that this 
kind of uh, armor was made of bronze uh, it's probable that uh, it could be could be actually of other material not even ma metal to be honest but if it was of, of, of metal it was in the way in the scale fashion that we have said before I mean this all these small scale uh, pieces um, sewn into the, the support that here was attached either to the horse or to the saddle um, the there are also um, other there is another Lycian uh, evidence it's a tomb painting actually that it may be datable to the first half of the fifth century BC that could show something um, a sort of um, a proto um, armor in this sense uh, of this uh, an early version of this defense which is uh, a attached to the saddle and covering the riders knees right so there were probably also different ways naturally of, of making this um, of the this uh, material uh, excuse me this this kind of uh, defense of realizing it materially speaking um, and this was basically the kind of of armored cavalry that we find in Achaemenid employ right and this continued to exist till the very end of the Achaemenid Empire mm -hmm. Uh, we know, for instance, that uh, the Persian cavalry at the Battle of Issus, uh, with um, their horses, were protected by rows of linked armored plates, lamnae or lamne, and uh, are so these are late sources stating that actually. So they're also a bit conjectural, and you can't really take them so like uh, reliably. Arian, that is also very late, uh, is, uh, very late source say, is, says that uh, at the Battle of, of Gaugamena, the the, the Massagetae um, uh, had um, uh, were riding armored horses. So the, the Massagetic cavalry was uh, deployed on the Persian left at this battle, and you know it was also kind of um, kind of important for the, the, the history of that battle. And those were troops who came straight from the steppes, so that were the ones who were still kind of more uh, the, the, the in contact with the the horse armored, uh, the let's say the armored horse tradition, and that could bring more easily this kind of type of, type of armor type of armored cavalry. The mm, in spite of the use of this, at this point, foreign troops that fundamentally didn't even, I believe, technically were part of the empire. At least, it, that, as you know, I try to explain uh, on Schwerpunkt very often how the the concept of empire this time is very non non physical. It has to do with the degree of political relation with the subjected peoples. So, but still, the Massagetae were mostly living. You know, outside the, the Achaemenid Empire, as their bulk of, of tribesmen in in the steppes, etc. So, but they were habitual, evidently habitual allies of the Persians, and brought brought this kind of 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 of, of uh, steppe tradition with them every time. Remember that the Achaemenid army was very multi-ethnic, and and all the various. Uh, ethnic specialties were used very functionally all together to kind of provided this various um, specialties that could be very useful especially in a combined arm uh, tactic um, con um, military uh, tradition so uh, and in spite of th this armored horses uh, still the, the wide the wide majority of Achaemenid cavalry was unarmored right so uh, especially um, uh, the horses. This is a constant in history that the uh, you can see it very clearly even in the Western Middle Ages that the majority of horses were actually not armored. Mm -hmm. That the the armored cavalryman was already an elite in himself, and uh, it was rare that their their horses could be armored as well because it was extremely expensive.
right so that speaks it for itself and naturally also it has a cost even in terms of mobility uh, and therefore effective tactical employment um, so that's that's an elite that you want to use in the usually towards the end of the battle keeping it on a, as a reserve for the final shock etc or well it really depends on how you want to employ it or how you need to employ it but um, let's say that they most remain an elite the word not meant even to be thrown away like you know like skirmish cavalry uh, cavalry etc um, the there is a um, um, and so the it, it seems that this armored horse armored cavalry was confined to either uh, imperial guards like the ones of Cyrus and, and we've seen before um, either the this uh, auxiliaries from the steppes chiefly the Masagetai or Masagetai and also probably the Bactrians that were to develop actually a very um, a very and probably the, the, the high some of the highest at least um, uh, cataphract traditions especially in the late in, in a few centuries um, and uh, and uh, that were fighting in fact alongside the Achaemenids at the Battle of Gaugamela. I want to stress the fact that here the whole concept of ultra heavy cataphract cavalry was yet to be developed even in the steppes as far as we know I mean it, it already existed in terms of the, the concept but still you know it, it wasn't fully developed in the way we know in the following centuries like you know it, there was a wagoning of their armors etc but this is something we will leave actually for another for another chapter but there is also another um, milieu that we can identify to in within the the actually the same Achaemenid borders. Um, that seems to have been the the offspring of 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 you know of some armor horse armored cavalry in um, in the uh, in the Achaemenid uh, in the Achaemenid Empire. And and this is uh, Anatolia, so roughly today's Turkey. Um, da where we have seen before with also Xenophon actually saying that, um, that this most of this um, uh, uh, I, I'm lost here but he, he was basically saying oh no okay we haven't still said it I believe but yeah basically here there is evidence of heavier uh, of armored cavalry, they're probably something that preceded, in fact, the same uh, as as a local tradition, the same Achaemenid domination, right? And it would remain historically, like especially in areas that were more feudal in nature, like for instance Cappadocia, that, w or that was per pretty mountainous land, um, more similar, in fact, to to Persia in some way, um, uh, environmentally speaking. Uh, the um, Where were we? Oh yeah, that um, the we, we mostly get this from artistic representations that are concentrated in the region, right? And so uh, there seems to be no doubt that at least some cavalry from that region had this kind of heavy equipment uh, on a regular base. And the same goes for Armenia, um, that would also. Mm, it was a place that was eventually was able to combine a bit this um, military traditions and already had its kind of aristocratic, quasi-feudal um, uh, political and social system that could provide such heavy cavalry. And in fact, it seems that even the same during the same Battle of Gaugamela, um, the Armenians and Cappadocians were deployed on on the Persian right. Um, uh, were maybe a correspondence of what the Masageta were on, on the left so that they were similarly equipped as this kind of two heavier cavalry wings that were to to shield the flanks of the Achaemenid uh, formation. There is uh, also we were told, maybe I, I skipped something in, in the process, what I want to say is that 
the there was some kind of uh, other, especially uh, cavalryman armor, armor that uh, was mostly conceived for um, for the bridal arm, the bridal arm that is the so-called care, at least in Greek, that um, the, the Xenophon in his Kuropaidia ascribes chiefly to the sighted chariot drivers, so that uh, that are normally more exposed to, to enemy fire in the sense that, okay, not maybe not more than, than calorie method, but they have to hold the bridles because they have to, to, to lead sometimes two or four horses at a time, and that therefore have their uh, usually don't have their shield. By the way, we'll see now that most uh, Persian cavalry didn't seem quite to use make a a, a, um, a great use of shields, on, on or at least they were relatively small. Um, so this uh, arm forearm guard was seemingly uh, important. You know, in in later time, in Hellenistic times, chariot drivers were usually. They even are witnessed, if I'm not wrong, in some occasion with int as entire uh, cataphract armor, like with the wall arms. At least were were all in s uh, protected in scale armor for from the same reason. So it's possible, actually, that in the Achaemenid arm uh, army, charioteers were equipped uh, in a similar in a, in a similar fashion. By the way, uh, on his on horsemanship, Xenophon uh, rec uh, recommends this kind of um, uh, brittle arm guard uh, for the same Greek cavalry and uh, in in this letter uh, excuse me not Xenophon uh, uh, this is uh, yeah yeah sorry uh, I messed up the Xen same Xenophon and in this last work he uh, that is in the, the second half of uh, the first half of the fourth century we see he says that basically um, uh, this uh, brittle armor guard was a, 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 a new invention, mm. which uh, doesn't clearly answer whether it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, w f first of all, for whom was it really new? Was it new for the Greeks that are advised to use it? Was it new now for because it was newly invented into the Persian, uh, into the Persian Empire? Um, does it does this go in parallel with the um, the heavening of the, the general heavening of the um, Achaemenid cavalry armor? We don't really know, but it seems to suggest it was some form of experimentalism at this time that in involved, in fact, this new forms uh, of armor and. Um, and that it, it goes, uh, let's say, uh, a bit uh, probably, there are perhaps other reasons, also the spread of cavalry this time, especially among the Greeks, that up to that time it's not that they had made a uh, very few use of cavalry as it's usually thought, but you know, surely cavalry was not the first Hellenic arm, they were, they were, they were mostly all about infantry, so this could be partly explained. And Xenophon, unfortunately, is not uh, more specific in this, but it's kind of... Um, so, uh, as I was noticing before, um, most Achaemenid cavalry seems to have fought without shields, or better, the... the um, there is a few evidence of it, at least. And this is not really um, an exception, because even other peoples like the same Greeks or the Thracians or Macedonians um, w do not seem to have made a, a great use of it uh, either. Mm, this may be just a lack in the sources, uh, I mean a structural one, because maybe these shields were not so important to be named or they were small. We know, for instance, that the Scythians actually made use of, uh, of shields of cane and leather, um, which uh, were not actually very big shields, but um, probably, let's say that shields were not this essential part of the cavalry equipment. By the way, shields are heavy, kind of, even if they're, they, they kind of hamper your movement, you have to, to use them either with, with an arm that on horseback has to hold the bridle, that, you know, on, it, it, sometimes on horseback is way more important to 
to be oh, as well as on, on foot to be also more dynamic rather than protected so it, it, it really depends and um, the this is the, the seemingly the um, the uh, the state of uh, of the of the question but um, there are definitely illustrations of Achaemenid cavalry shields as well um, yeah um, the um, there is also another maybe uh, indirect evidence of how our shield uh, used in the Achaemenid cavalry from Herodotus when he talks about Xerxes cavalry um, armed as the infantry um, so y the 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 Archimedes infantry definitely made you extensive use of, of shields like just the the Assyrian uh, had done previously uh, the, the shield was the Garon type it was also relatively large and uh, etc so um, definitely if you have shields among infantry you have them also among cavalry and um, also because sometimes the, these fighters can be the same person uh, mounting and dismounting but the Garen especially seems to be a bit too large than uh, than the average cavalry shield it probably was smaller for, for evident reason especially when it takes lighter cavalry that at that point if it's generally not so armored or not armored at all at that point would rely mostly on speed and probably would also do without shield, or at least it would do with with a with a very light one. And generally speaking, um, uh, Persian cavalry was chiefly about this, and it was normal, you know, because most cavalry, just like most infantry, was at this time rather rather light, right? So, but um, what else can we say about this? Yeah, uh, but we we always have, however, to bear in mind that all of these statements derive from the fact that we don't have enough evidence, because it's obvious that shields were used extensively. It's just that we we don't have the actual historical evidence, but logically enough, these troops definitely had shields um, that were widely known since millennia at this point in, in human warfare so wha what's the what's the deal other oh, other peoples actually did um, the um, there is however some change that may have happened in the um, the um, uh, in, oh, even in the Persian army, in this sense, with, with, as we have seen before, with the heavening in the armor, could have been also uh, could have happened also in the he uh, heavening of the shields, and this um, hypothesis would be supported by some evidence in, in Hellenic art from the mid fifth century that um, basically represents several um, troops. We have discussed them also in that video I made on the Nubian infantry of the Achaemenid army. Um, when depicting several peoples of of the of the ancient world also belonging to mythology like the amazons for instance that you know were this kind of mythical people but also were the basically if you rationalize it would be the, the greek understanding of those uh, maidens that that actually fought as men into the into the uh, into the scythians armies uh, that etc. And some of these troops are equipped in Persian style. And it's very interesting that on that video on the U Nubian infantry, you see in fact these black soldiers uh, equipped with w w with a typically Persian equipment. And you see the Amazons as well, and they have this kind of shielded. Um, the, the, the they have these shields and also um, and. Uh, blended Greek and Persian equipment and, and gear it's and so on. So it's sometimes definitely difficult to tell uh, how the, the, the situation uh, was. The, um, and from the Gadal Yamas evidence we were talking about before, there is however the uh, the understanding that 
uh, the, the, the gear that was required in that sense to that Babylonian colonist by the, the, the Achaemenid government uh, required not less than two shields so this is particularly interesting as well and kind of is more certain in some ways and may makes you understand shields were definitely used pretty much by cavalry because that was a cavalryman um, and um, and many people say well maybe they were not used on horseback well why not I mean you have a shield why why wouldn't you use it I mean it doesn't make sense sometimes there are this kind of mechanistic uh, you know objections like you know why 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 shouldn't you use a shield on horseback? Of course you can't y you you can't do it or you can't do it if you want. But the hell you know it's normal to go on horseback or mounted equipped. You have a lamellar armor as we've seen in here. Uh, uh, I mean or at least a, a scale armor. Well, why shouldn't you? Because the the scale armor the the uh, Gadol Yamas it was it was a scale armored one he had to to wear. So. Why wouldn't you have a shield? Of course, then uh, the more actually it, it happens sometimes that the more the heavier you're equipped um, in terms of armor, and the less you need a shield. This is true in many in many contexts. You can see that even in in medieval warfare, when full plate armor kicks in, basically knights don't use shields anymore. They they become so small, then effectively some of them are not even used, and you. They they they're kind of useless. So, but that that was naturally something very different from uh, from this kind of armor that was also qualitatively very much lower than the one of the 15th century, as, as you understand. But um, anyway, lighter cavalry might have definitely used uh, shields, and there is no reason whatsoever for which it, you can object that. Um, um, definitely, if you look into uh, to Greek cavalry at this time to make a comparison, uh, some uh, at this point, according to the recruitment uh, requirements uh, in, in terms of equipment, the some Greek, uh, some cavalrymen had to own shields, but not necessarily to use them on horseback. But this doesn't mean that they were forbidden from doing it either. So it doesn't make sense. Um, uh, and. Uh, and sometimes, uh, just remember that cavalry was, uh, in a sense, they, 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 they could mount and dismount. So this depends. It may, as we were saying before, the shield can be kind of cumbersome sometimes, and it's preferable to use it on 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 foot than on, on horseback. But you know, why can't you use that as well? Uh, in 404 BC, the Athenian cavalry, for instance, was meant to keep both their horses and their shields with them, so um, they so that they could uh, patrol um, during the night, armed as hoplites, and uh, in 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 the morning getting on horseback as well. So this is there is this double thing, but it doesn't absolutely mean that the shields were not used. And um, okay, but now I wouldn't like to go too much in detail. The um, and um, there there are actually other even it's but now we we're talking about shields chiefly, and I'm not really interested into this. Let's just say that among some other informations we can find I don't know what to say that there is some indication also of colors that were that the this armored cavalry had um, but I don't think it's particularly important now um, uh, we can't make a general conclusion about the the employment of this cavalry that we have already expa explained roughly. I'm uh, talking about the, the, the various things. Well, naturally, this was a very contained cavalry in number for the reasons that we have explained: cost, also social status, etc. And and this was an elite that naturally was also a qualitative elite, so that. Um, a heavily uh, armored uh, 
uh, here heavily Israel, uh, right? But it's still a heavily armored cavalry was you know the best you could find in terms of one versus one at this point. So it's um, it. It, it was definitely saved uh, as a resource on the battlefield and thrown into the, the moment of the most delicate moments, etc. And um, yeah, but the the evidence of tactics. Now we will talk about that in another time. But um, it's obvious that it was never a prevalent number. But Achaemenid cavalry actually was pretty consistent, even in numbers, never becoming majority compared to infantry, but still having this dynamic effect and the Greeks feared Persian cavalry usually they, they even didn't want to fight on, on in open field because 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 of it because they effectively lacked cavalry at this time. You're talking about classical Greece before Hellenism and Macedonian warfare brought in uh, pretty heavy cavalry in turn. What you can say about the armor in itself is that obviously Alexander uh, Alexander the Great arrives and, and destroys the Achaemenid Empire, conquers it, and occupies that. And uh, as you know, there are the successor states, etc. And what you see in the successor states is actually some sort of uh, improvement of armor that seemingly derived from contacts with Iranic uh, cavalries, um, chiefly from the northwest, uh, excuse me, the northeast. Uh, towards the steppes, in fact, so, so for always from the, you know, uh, direction from from which into the Middle East m most of this cavalry tradition came from, because actually the Caucasus was a pretty solid bulwark. The the the, uh, the Iranian plateau not so much. I mean, it was definitely for whoever wanted to conquer it, but still it was very fluid w in within it. Also, the frontiers with the steppes were not really quite clear in the north. Um, so you always have, especially if you look at Seleucid cavalry, it seems at, at one point it started using cataphracts, which the Achaemenids, not even the Achaemenids, had done. And this seemingly happens, by it's just an hypothesis, after the, uh, the Antiochus III uh, anabasis against uh, in Persia, as a matter of fact, so fighting against those kind of peoples, um, and but it's just you know sometimes it says okay you you need to enter in contact with those peoples to to fight, uh, you know uh, in order to to effectively learn how to use this armor. Well, you don't really know how you need how to learn that. It's just that you may be uh, required to have that similar equipment to the, to theirs exactly to cope with them and then definitely you can maintain that kind of equipment even for yourself but it doesn't necessarily mean that you need that in order to 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 achieve it uh, by yourself the, the problem is that if you don't have this what seem to be technological improvements it's not because people are stupid it's simply that these technologies most of the times are not so convenient because cataphract cavalry is something that you have to have a huge empire with a solid centralized tax system and resources available in order to field because it's really like you know uh, an emorgy of resources just to field a couple of hundreds of them and, and at that point you may want to invest in something else including light cavalry um, what is interesting by the way is that even the uh, just like the Achaemenids did the, 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 uh, the successor states of Alexander the Great kept um, making use of this um, Iranic cavalries from the east as well partially definitely of those cavalries from Anatolia that we noticed before um, and therefore the the contact remaining there and, and what you see is that there was never actually and I because I got interested into these things in the past and, and I, I thought but you know couldn't really these models be fully integrated into the into these armies like I mean couldn't I don't know an empire like sales would want to adopt horse archers and as, as uh, combine it with phalanx and therefore becoming a kind of unstoppable force the point is that um, first of all you need a society that need that kind of heads towards that because two artificial measures in this sense are not going to work even certain 
uh, now we're getting the thing is getting complicated but let's say that they, they definitely did use of mercenaries but they didn't need to um, to integrate them in their army because simply if you're a sanitary population you can't have horse archers like in the nomadic steppes either you can hire them but they will never be part of your world and if you sanitarize them they are gonna lose that ability and this is something that happened many times even in the same Europe during the Middle Ages you know at a certain point kingdoms like Hungary like uh, like Poland start settling the commons of the steppes but you know after a couple of generations they didn't have anything like their actual original military traditions anymore guess why because they sedentarized and the same goes for all the populations that are effectively like think about the, the, the Bulgars like the Avars the the Hungars that were kind of similar to this um, after even so many years uh, so many centuries but they effectively lost that why because because it was not needed anymore they w when you sanitarize the, there are other advantages that are intrinsic to that so it didn't it doesn't even make sense to say okay uh, you know you wanna uh, you wanna you wanna my keep that because it, it's not convenient I mean uh, then there is naturally also this large world of especially of uh, Eastern Europe in 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 the whole Asian continent, especially in Central Asia, where the actually only in Central Asia, the in the, where you have this constant contact with 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 peoples of the steppes, like constant forever. So that's why even certain countries of kind of Mongolic tradition in their military. Think about all the the empires, the the Khanates that 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 formed uh, in in very far fra uh, uh, away places from Mongolia after the disgregation of, of the Mongol Empire. Uh, they, they they maintained this context with the, the steppes, and 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 they were kind of you know. Uh, but just guess how it finished that? Well, yeah, okay, it, it took firearms to f to to have something that could. Uh, effectively have a, 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 a put an end to this um, um, you know combined tactics of the steps that in fact up to the 15th to 16th century had been the most effective thing ever but that had not even been a matter of the tactic in itself but of the peoples that practiced it and the reason why they practiced it you can't have a horse archer in that that fights the way horse archers do, like uh, with that effectiveness. If you don't leave in uh, in the steps, you can't replicate horse archers, even crossbowmen on horseback. We were talking about that incidentally the other day on uh, in the video on the Battle of Fourmigny. Well, the English and the French during the Hundred Years' War definitely had horse archers and they used them, but they used them in a very different way <laughs> from which. The, the, uh, the Mongols did and that speaks a little bit for that difference that I wanted to try to explain to you before rel between uh, also the cavalries of peoples like the Sasanians that were sedentary cavalries at that point in spite of the continuous injection of these nomadic uh, auxiliaries and subjugated tribes from the steppes from from the, tr the peoples of the steppes proper because it, it, it's something different and and there are different traditions, different mindsets, but chiefly then you know before even the the, the actual tactics or the actual equipment you carry out. So that that if, that at that point are just a reflection of of those differences as well. So uh, the what to say? Um, there was an ev there was also a progressive evolution into this. It wasn't so static as it's often said. Like I also presented it a bit during the introduction, saying, "Okay, well, the word cataphracts in here." I, I was schematizing a little bit, but I think during the video I kind of uh, wrapped it up in the sense that uh, you know I, I told you that even the cataphracts uh, evolved over time. That the ultra heavy cataphract at this time, at the beginning, you could say of the Kemenian Empire, was was didn't quite exist. That there, were, there were improvements and kind of reforms that, especially for tribal units, are very difficult to call like that. But let's say that uh, societies change, 
And when you look at this very heavily armored cavalry, so the first thing you have to think is that wh where do they get their resources from? So if you see that there is a wagoning in the armor, you realize that something happened politically or socially, so that uh, th there is an increased social stratification or, or, or a condition of political hegemony uh, or something that basically brought to that elite to to aff to be able to afford in the first place such an expensive armor. You can't think of these soldiers as these warriors as just um, you know someone who happened to 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 hand down generation by generation this heavy armor. That this a effect really happened, but it was mostly in the ranks of of kings of chieftains, not of the common no one in the steppes. Then in obviously in, in, in such a developed and advanced empire like the Persian one, uh, it was a matter of also of kind of wealth distribution and how the, the Achaemenid state was able to form even these elite bodies that we have seen as the guardsmen and so on. But there is also an anti a, a further anti-technologistic consideration that you can make that I also hope I have been uh, clear enough before about um, that is that you you don't really need to be ultra armored to to be strong. Uh, armor has a cost in itself, even in uh, on the battlefield, not just you know for producing it. It 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 having uh, you know it it weights a lot, so you you it it it, it exhausts you and it creates problems of movement, etc. So um, uh, in a nutshell, you don't need ultra heavy armor to to win a battle. And even less to win a war, uh, as you understand, and um, and there are many meaningful um, considerations you can draw from this, but we will talk about them in another time. For the rest, these are kind of endless topics you could ramble again and again for hours. But we will. This this video was meant to talk exclusively, not even just actually of horse armor at all, but of kind of um, rather cavalry armor, but maybe next time we will do something more um, more precise even, but we will definitely be talking a lot about Achaemenid warfare, the Achaemenid army in, um, in this con context of, of ancient warfare, but um, for now, let's okay. Let's finish it here. Um, so uh, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.